Good morning and good evening, wherever in the world you may be at this moment. I'm Mark Fraser. I'm the co-director of the India China Institute, and it's my great privilege to welcome you all to this uh, book launch and celebration in many ways, because uh, before I turn it over to the, the co-editors and, and co-moderators moderators for today's uh, panel, I want to uh, just point out that this is in many ways a reunion uh, and a, a chance to reflect on the multiple uh, types of collaborations that have been ongoing related to urban ecology, uh, public space, and other topics um, between ICI, the India China Institute, and Urban at Parsons, including not just uh, faculty uh, at Parsons at the New School and other departments at the New School, but our scholarly network of students, uh, collaborators, practitioners around the world, and particularly for today's topic in the Pearl River Delta. Uh, many of us uh, on today's panel were uh, participants in a, a workshop at the Shenzhen Biennale in 2018. Uh, and there was, as, the, as uh, Tim and, and Miandrag will tell us soon, uh, a conference here at the New School in the fall of 2017 uh, at which uh, many of today's chapters uh, have now emerged as, as the published work. And for full disclosure, I will uh, point out that uh, I am the author and I'm proud to be the author of, of one of the chapters in, in the book that we'll be discussing today. So without uh, further ado, let me now turn it over to Tim Jackna, who is the Dean of the College of Design, Architecture, Art and Planning at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and who was a visiting uh, scholar here at the New School in, in fall of 2016, I should point that out. And his uh, co-moderator and co-editor, Miodrag Mitrashinovich, who is professor of urbanism and architecture at Parsons here at the New School. Well, thank you very much. And Tim uh, and Miodrag look forward to a great event and discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And good morning, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, I will be very brief and uh, just basically uh, uh, explain the protocol for the for this morning, and then I will give the word to my colleague and co-editor Tim Jackner, who will uh, moderate the panel today. So uh, the idea is that uh, we start with brief introductions, introduction with about five minutes, and then we have um, um, uh, speakers in the order of uh, uh, Joan Du, uh, Mary Ann O'Donnell, uh, Paul Chu, and Brian McGrath, and then myself. Uh, each following uh, with about 10 minute presentation, which is then going to be followed by uh, a discussion that goes until uh, 10.30 this morning. So uh, Tim, um, uh, you can take it from here. Great, and I um, don't wanna take up too much of the time. I wanna give the time to the authors, but I thought it may help to just sort of give a framing to the book and to the, uh, of which the, discussions, the talks today are sort of a sampling. Um, as Mark pointed out, this um, project started in actually in 2016 with a symposium in Hong Kong, followed up by one in New, in New York, uh, many of the presentations of which grew into chapters for the, this book. We've snowballed and brought on other authors in the, in the meantime. Uh, the impetus for this really grew out of I guess the contact that Miodrag and I had had um, with this geographical area, the Greater Bay Area, I was um, at that time in Hong Kong, Miodrag was a frequent visitor. Um, and the questions of what is the type of urban context, the type of public space that is emerging in this uh, quite unique historical juncture um, in this quite unique place. We also realized that we knew a lot of people who were interrogating this question from multiple angles in the area of planning, architecture, design, art, critical theory, social sciences, um, came up with the ambition to bring, mobilize these perspectives, bring them together in sort of a holographic presentation of ways of approaching this questioning. Uh, You'll see a sample of some of these approaches in the authors presenting today. Um, we have had contributors who take very analytical um, approaches, you know, taken from the, the um, 
social sciences um, or um, the, the hard sciences, the technical sciences. We've seen a few that are, are presenting a, a pedagogical approach using uh, pedagogy as a way of interrogating this condition. Um, and also others that are really looking at learning by designing, design, designing, planning as a way of engaging a context, generating knowledge about this context and, and um, then acting on it. Um, you'll see both in this presentation, these presentations and in the chapters sort of um, the notion of the public realm of which public space is a subset, one facet. And I think we've got a, ver a great variety of ways in which public space has been sort of situated in the other multiple aspects of publicness, public goods, public life, public infrastructure, public policy, public action. And you'll see a good sampling of that today as well. Um, so I don't want to take too, any more time than this from the authors. Um, I guess it just remains for me to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Juan Du, who is Dean of University of Toronto's John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. Um, I know her from Hong Kong. We overlap a few years in Hong Kong pre previous to this. Um, well, the Shenzhen Experiment, Story of China's Instant City, is her recent book, and, I, and a facet of that will be reflected in her, her talk. So, uh, John, I'll cede the floor to you. Thank you, Tim, um, and thank you, Mark and Miodrag, for organizing and also at, uh, having created and shaped this great book that you have invited me to be a part of. Um, I know time is very short, so I'll get started uh, quickly and perhaps we can have time for, for some discussions after. So, um, okay. so someone give me a okay if you can see the screen. Okay. Thanks, Tim. All right, so uh, into this uh, wonderful, um, diverse collection of, uh, of chapters and essays for the book, I contributed um, a text called titled Where City Meets Village, Contexting Public Spaces During Shenzhen's and Urban Renewal. Uh, for the, um, for the, for the audience, I just to let you know that I, I've been based in Asia for two decades. I just recently moved back to North America now in, in Toronto, and I find myself constantly um, trying to adjust to the audience of whether they understand what was happening in China, what has happened in China, what, you know, where is Shenzhen? Um, so I'm going to just try to contextualize a little bit since uh, I am the first speaker uh, this morning. So my text is divided into um, short subsections. It's a relatively uh, sh short text for, for a, um, a text-based publication. Um, where I will come back to this at the end of kind of speaking to uh, the way Mark and Tim and Miodra have introduced the various methods uh, that have um, played into the, the production knowledge and what was presented in the paper. But first, uh, you know, let's talk about the Greater Bay, the other Greater Bay that's not in uh, California, but in China. So we're really looking at the regions around uh, what is the Pearl River Delta. And the population is about 120 million. It's really emerging as one of the world's largest mega regions uh, where the cities are, are quite almost uh, linking into each other. Um, however, the, this, this kind of population density and urbanization is a relative recent phenomenon if you look at a global history of urbanization. So this is a NASA image of the per, er, kind of the media area around Pearl River Delta. This is Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Dongguan, Guangzhou, Fushan, and Zhonghai. And here is the Pearl River and the mouth of the Pearl River Delta. And you know, if you take a look at the amount of greenery and the whites, for those you're not used to looking at satellite photos, the whites are build up areas. Um, and this is about, this is um, 10 years after Shenzhen was established formally as a city. 
So you could see that um, some of the, the whites, the urbanization in the really the city center region have already started. However, I wanna show you this image. This is just 20 years later where you could see uh, the, the amount of urbanization just really rapidly expanded. In the span of 20 years, um, this, this uh, speed rate scope of urbanization uh, is uh, unprecedented in human history, not only in China. So really placing what we're discussing today into that, because you know, in my title, I, I mentioned urban renewal of Shenzhen, but if we understand that Shenzhen by conventional and I believe false narratives is only 40 years old, uh, we're already speaking about a massive urban renewal effort that's been in the city since 20 years ago. So it's a city rapidly, ur ur rapidly urbanized and then now rapidly being renewed, meaning demolished and rebuilt. So if you have heard of Shenzhen or maybe even been to Shenzhen, this is the typical image. It's a, a what you imagine, a very modern uh, planned city um, that is uh, picturesque uh, at some, some sort, but, but full of skyscrapers, uh, skyscrapers and modern buildings. And this has been heralded as sort of a, a a, a Asia planning model, uh, at least if not a if not a global one. However, you know, the, in my title, I said is where city meets village. So if you have not heard of urban villages, and you may be surprised that in such a new modern city, there are many many historic villages that are located right in the middle of the city. And you know, this is a a mapping of the essentially the city center of Shenzhen. This is the city hall. I'll show you a, a little bit of an image later, but this was really the political or is a political administrative center from an urban planning perspective. Um, and the most important part of the city ceremonially, symbolically representing modernity in China. Um, however, if what you see in white are the locations of what previously were historic villages that's been around for centuries, that has really emerged become uh, what it, the terms called uh, urban villages or villages in the city because they have really grown uh, to really at the same time as the urbanization uh, process and what I would describe as a parallel urbanism of kind of new city building as well as a informal urban development of the village itself building. Uh, this is a, a zoom in village of that and my the, the focus of my particular paper is really along the central axis is that this is the, the city, the heart of the city with the city hall with a giant um, urban civic plaza where everyone would identify that as the most important symbolic uh, public space of Shenzhen, um, and I would argue that um, that while that is true, that it is a, a form of public space in Shenzhen, what's really interesting of uh, what's happening in Shenzhen and in the proverb Delta is that there are multiple diverse forms of urban spaces and, and public spaces uh, emerging at the same time, and it's really important for us to recognize the validity of all of them, uh, especially um, what, what, what I hopefully I can show you briefly, the um, Huanggang urban village that is right on the center of this axis. So this was a, a early urban planning map uh, a, a drawing of Shenzhen before it was even urbanized. You can see that the, the blue line is a, is a very early master plan that is really superimposed onto what was a rural landscape of uh, agricultural village uh, villages, historic villages and village industrialization. And in 20 years on the right is what um, has mostly followed that particular urban planning with the exception of if you look at I hope you can see my cursor um, over here there's little pockets of this is Gansia village uh, where it was pre-existing before whereas most of the other areas around was really agricultural or production land and then fast forward 20 years into the say the urban history um, the, the the master plan um, of the city, the CBD, essentially with the city hall, was this really large grand, uh, when it was finished, it was, it was um, titled in the local journals, newspapers as the grand urban living room. 
of Shenzhen. It really that this would be the heart and the public life. And you can see there's not much life in that public space. It's a giant, large um, public closet. Um, and if you go down further south on, on that axis, um, there are this very large stretch of greenery uh, that's mainly inaccessible but by pedestrians. Um, I'll save that critique for another time. And then in, previously ending the central axis was this very large um, convention center, which is what you see in the photo here, uh, designed by uh, German architecture office, GMP. Now, fast forward 20, it was mentioned 20 years later, the city wanted to expand further south um, beyond the convention center. And what they're encountering is a, a village, uh, which is at that time is called urban village. But um, you know, from my research that it, it has been around for uh, 800 years, uh, that has really organically emerged where the public spaces are in the streets and small forms of plaza. But the city wanted to demolish uh, the village and really create, uh, extend the central axis, creating a large public plaza in the, right in the middle of the previous uh, historic fabric. Um, and this is where uh, my research and my, my practice came in. We participated in an urban planning and design project a competition that really the city was calling, how can we demolish the village and build it and extend the center? And for us, using a method of um, interviews, spatial analysis, ethnography, historical methods, we started to really look at the transformation of the city and the village together and recognizing that if we follow what the city was proposing, meaning complete demolition of the urban village and building into the sectors, it really is against um, the nature of how Shenzhen rapidly developed and the city and the village really is one entity. Um, and that uh, not only that, we would be displacing 90% of the population here who are migrant workers um, without any form of public housing or affordable housing they have access to. So this is what the city was planned. This is what we, all the competitors who entered this uh, international uh, competition consultation was handed to say, this is what we want. Now give us something beautiful we can show and convince everyone. But we looked at the urban fabric here and there was uh, it, for, for me, it was not acceptable to just say, we're just going to demolish all of this and build that for the sake of creating a public space for the city. That was really used as the main argument that it was important for the public of the city. Um, so we went through various methods, um, uh, utilizing um, computation and analysis and ecotech to really first acknowledge that the, the buildings that were built in their urban villages were built very quickly and the qualities are not all great. So this isn't necessarily a hundred percent preservation project either. It's just say understanding, you know, rather than just turning, demolishing the village and turning into that, is there a more organic way to really plan and design the process of redevelopment so that it works with economy, it works with the social and cultural organizations of villages so the urban village itself can redevelop rather than having external developers or government funding. And that's what we propose. Um, and we were able to be selected as uh, the winner of this uh, international consultation. And what we would propose was a phased development where it's an organic uh, rebuilding of the, the city, the village, and the public spaces that are much more smaller in scale compared to the conventional understanding. Of, uh, this was a decade ago in China of understanding what public space is supposed to be and how public life is supposed to be organized in. Uh, a, a modern city um, and economic where, uh, powerhouse. So again, this is, you know, uh, kind of phase three, we called it, or stage three. You can see the difference in scale uh, between what the city originally had, had proposed and what we're proposing and how uh, the, the scales of spaces, the scales of public spaces, we've really tried to preserve a lot of the smaller scale of community spaces and public spaces and parks, plazas, and while at the same time still allowing an organic redevelopment processes the village itself. So, you know, that was, that was a very, at the time, um, again, this is 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, at the time it was perceived, our, our proposal was perceived to be really radical because 
the government uh, from the mayor's office really wanted to demolish all urban villages. Um, and here we were saying, no, don't, don't demolish anything, even in the most valuable important center. And we were arguing that it is really important to preserve the civic life of the urban fabric at the smaller scale and a, an understanding of the coexistence um, of a, a past history and uh, the, the contemporary history of the city. Um, I think I, I'm out of time. So I, I would just conclude by saying that uh, the, the, the text really summarized what I would consider a decade of both um, field work, science, social science uh, research, uh, oral history, uh, urban, the typical urban analysis trained as an architect for me, you know, utilizing methods of, that's more conventional to architecture and urban design, urban planning. But a really important part of that method was what kind of really understanding a deep history of Shenzhen, which I'm not going to go over today in a 10 minute presentation, but but I would say that that prehistory Shenzhen is what uh, was mentioned uh, of my book, um, The Shenzhen Experiment, of really understanding that um, we cannot look at the cities based on, or especially Shenzhen based on the past 40 years, we had to look at it within, within a framework of a thousand years uh, in order to truly understand what were all of the forces that has went into the city making process and the urban villages are, I would say, one of the most prominent and visible, both physically, spatially, economically, politically visible um, continuity, continuity from that pre-urban history to the urban history and has very much shaped that um, that process and, and still continue to do so today. And I understand that Marianne will be presenting uh, sometime after me and she will, uh, I'm sure, give us a, a very vivid portrayal of what's happening on the ground in the villages uh, right now. So, you know, I, I ended my text by, by in some ways advocating for the importance of research and design going parallel with each other. And that, uh, that before we demolish and design anything new, it's very, very important to know what was there, even if everyone tells you that there was nothing there uh, previously of importance and that you could just get rid of it and build a new. Uh, and that, what, that through design and through research, how we can contribute to the topic of urban space and urban realm in the city um, should really be even from a knowledge production point of view uh, and uh, professional practice should, should also include advocacy, advocacy and contestation rather than um, just following what, uh, say from a policy standpoint, uh, was already made. And again, this is maybe surprising to the American audience or North American audience that in, in a modern city of China um, today or 10 years ago, that uh, through advocacy and contestation, that the city would, uh, if not reverse a policy of complete demolition, at least post that policy. And, um, and uh, this is again 10 years ago, uh, have uh, incorporated our design and our planning into the urban planning policy of Huanggang Village so that it, it was a much slower and more considered process of urban development. And I'm very happy to, to inform everyone that through this decade of very much collective work and the changing of public opinion today in Shenzhen, the policy of urban planning have now said that in the urban villages as locating urban centers, the primary method of development should be uh, of selective and integrated redevelopment rather than total demolition and rebuild. So I think that this is very much in some ways a success of how through two decades of collective action, through multiple parties, through all sectors of society from the government um, to, to um, the works that, that for example, Marianne and her colleagues does on the ground in Shenzhen, um, that we can make a deep a difference, that we can contribute, uh, especially in, in, a, in a Chinese city. And hopefully we can do it there. We should be able to do everywhere else as well. So thanks very much. I will. Great. Sure. Well, thank you, and and thank you for the the smooth transition into the into the next um, 
talk, which will be our, um, our friend, Marianne O'Donnell, um, joining us um, from Shenzhen. So Marianne O'Donnell is an artist ethnographer, um, resident in Shenzhen, um, which is also, has also really been the focus of her practice. She's, uh, her projects include her blog, Shenzhen Noted, Handshake 302, um, an art space in the city. Uh, she's published um, or uh, co-edited with Winnie Wong and Jonathan Bach, the um, book that many of you may know, Learning from Shenzhen, China's Post Mao Experiment from Special Zone to Model City. So with that, I will invite Marianne. Great. Hey, thank you. For the, um, thank you for bringing me on. I apologize. I'm kind of confused with my technology. So there's two of me in the group. Um, but we'll go with the picture. Um, I'm really happy to talk with y'all again. It was really fun when the group came to Shenzhen in end of 2017, end of 2018, when we didn't realize that COVID was coming. Um, I'm in Longgang at the moment at a meeting. And so to take to have these meetings basically um, in Longgang, we live it, we have to stay in hotels because it's so far from the city center and they're all day meetings. But right now, because of the way COVID is operating cross borders within the city, um, outside the city and whatnot is all being tracked on our phones. And it's become really awkward because a lot of the programs don't allow for foreigners to actually participate in the um, in the surveillance, which means often, for example, if we go to a public space, um, it really does depend on whether or not the guard is willing to let you in because, for example, we can't register through the um, EPAL, through the medical insurance system. And so there are actually systems that we can't get into that are necessary for identification. And it becomes really fun because often they will believe the telephone but not a paper document. And so many of my um, tests, when I have to get a COVID test, so I had to get a COVID test, they had on-site COVID testing in the hotel. Um, it's seven days. You can have the test within seven days if you're, it, you haven't left Shenzhen for 14 days. But if you've been out of Shenzhen within the past 14 days, it's a two-day window for the test. So the turnaround is also very fast. Although we've been told that we may be able to go to um, Hong Kong. Hong Kong, the border may be opening. So we're excited. Um, I bring this up because one of the questions that really, that I've grappled with, with my work in Shenzhen is what actually constitutes public space because Shenzhen continues to be held up as an example to the developing world. And the kinds of public that are being held up are, is not actually critical public space. And it's often not even number of parts it's usually things like accessibility to the subway station, um, accessibility to electricity, water that does not turn off. And so it's basically very much the infrastructure of an urban life that many of us who were born into um, the United States after say the 60s, take for granted. My mother was born into the United States and she had, she used well water until she was 13. Um, and they had a public, um, the phone, they had the public phone lines where it was a 10 party line where 10 families in the same area shared the phone. And so if you were bored, because they didn't have televisions, you could actually just pick up the phone and listen in on your neighbor's conversations. Um, so that the idea of public, it's, it's, you know, it's actually kind of a return to Marx in the sense of what is the lowest level of lifestyle or life or support that 
um, human beings should be able to expect from where they live. And then that becomes the lowest um, salary. And so I struggle with this um, in a lot of different ways, but especially because there, the lack of critical public space is then, but clear accessibility, for example, to get here on um, public transportation, not a problem to get here through sub um, on a taxi, not to get to this hotel, not a problem because it's open, very convenient, very fast, very efficient. Um, Shenzhen is now one of the leaders in using hybrid cabs. Um, and most of the city is now connected through the subway, the metro system. But um, now being much more regulated at the level of the particular human body. And so it's become we it's become very much aware of which which malls are doing um, intensive regulation, which hotels are doing intensive regulation. Buses, for example, do not ask to see your COVID pass, but um, the Metro does. So all of these different questions of how public, the, the idea of the public, which is being op, which has been operational in Shenzhen is a modern city, a modern lifestyle. However, access to that is now increasingly regulated through um, internet, applications and through an integrated medical system that I'm very much aware of because I do not actually appear in. And so um, what happens is my access to a lot of spaces, which are not even critical public spaces, but for example, a hotel lobby is now becoming really increasingly dependent on the whims of the people who manage the entering and the exiting. Well, the exiting, you're always allowed to leave, but the entering of these spaces. And so I think I'll just leave it at that. You know, my paper looked at publicity, the public space and in terms of public schools, public transportation, um, access, you know, electricity, all of these kinds of things, which Chenzhen has been really effective at providing. Um, but written, of course, before COVID. And so, you know, looking at the lack of a critical public space and alternatives to the critical public space that had been built into the environment, but now also looking at how the body through COVID is being um, refined in how access to these public resources is being regulated and provided. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Marianne. Good, so um, I'll invite our um, next office to speak. Um, and this is a um, co-authored chapter, Brian McGrath and Paul Chu. Brian McGrath, those of you who are associated with the new school probably needs no introduction. He's professor of urban design former Dean of the School of Constructed Environments at Parsons School of Design, uh, pr publishes prolifically um, a number of books that are, are have really been references to me in you know, developing my own work. Um, I think one to point out for this group, this particular audience would be his 2010 publication, Growing Cities in a Shrinking World that Challenges in India and China. Um, He's been an advi external advisor for the Chuhai Department of Architecture, which features prominently in this chapter since 2005. Um, his co-author, um, uh, Paul Chu, um, is associate professor and head of the Department of Architecture at Chuhai College of Higher Education in Hong Kong, fellow of the Hong Kong Institute of Architects, founding member, Hong Kong Institute of Urban Design. Um, researches in so cultural sustainability and particularly sociological um, resilience and has been a contributing other two books, Factory Towns of South China and Villages in the City. Uh, so, um, Brian and Paul. 
Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Grace, Mark, Manjuridi, and the China Institute for many years of friendship, collegiality, and support. Um, and special thanks to Mia Jarg and Tim for inviting us and really great to see old friends like Marianne and Juan here. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Um, can everyone see? Okay. So three genealogies. Uh, we begin with the genealogy of Chuhai University established by Chinese nationalists in Guangzhou in 1947. Uh, resettled as Chuhai College in Mongkok, Kowloon, where it occupied various commercial buildings until 1992, when it relocated to Riviera Gardens in Chinwan New Territories. Never recognized by the British colonial government, Chuhai prospered hidden in Riviera Gardens po podium as an educational enclave in exile. Chuhai survived for the next 50 years with financial support from the nationalist government, ex itself in exile in Taiwan. Its degrees were conferred by the Republic of China's Ministry of Education and recognized by universities in the US and Canada. On the right side, uh, in 2016, the, the college moved uh, to the newly built uh, publicly facing campus overlooking the Pearl Sea in Tunmen. Tunmen is a strategic place and, and the new infrastructure linking um, both sides of the Greater Bay. Um, where it reestablished its university credentials, will, it, it will reestablish its university credentials as Chuhai University of Hong Kong, uh, recognized by the People's Republic of China. Chuhai uh, means Pearl Sea. As the first campus faced the Guangzhou waterfront, I can imagine the faculty, staff, and students traveling by boat between Guangzhou and Hong Kong following the declaration of the People's Republic in 1949. Like I did when I first traveled to Guangzhou from Hong Kong by overnight steamer in 1987. Thank you, Juan, for showing the image of what it looked like in 1989. Um, Pearl Sea, river, delta, estuary, or bay. Victoria Marshall's drawing on the left, I, I should say India China fellow, Victoria Marshall's drawing on the left, shows the complex hydrology where the Pearl River forms a delta to the west, the depositing of sediment into the sea, and both an estuary, the exchange of fresh and seawater uh, uh, to the east, and the forming of a bay, a three-sided body of water, uh, with Hong Kong and Macau as its gateways. Paul? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, um, I am speaking on behalf of a uh, Chunwan uh, resident uh, who has been living here for over 30 years. I started living there at the age of nine. And uh, Chunwan literally in Chinese, it means um, shallow bay. But for me, the water wasn't really shallow because in my memory, the first time that I really touched the water um, of the Great Bay area, uh, or we call it the um, Pearl River Delta uh, previously, uh, was actually the beaches that uh, my father taught me to swim. Uh, those were my first memory of the uh, Pearl River Delta, by which at that time, that was actually in the colonial period that uh, nobody really talked about the Pearl River Delta. We only realized that we, we were sort of in an enclave condition. Um, and then when I um, grew up, I used it to take the ferry uh, through the Victoria Harbor, which was uh, one of the components in the water body of this uh, Pearl River Delta, uh, traveling uh, back and forth to the CBD and then went back to Hong Kong U to have the architecture education and so on and so forth. Um, today, the water in the uh, western uh, side of the Hong Kong, uh, where, the, where I used it to swim, was not really very good for swimming because uh, after the uh, Shenzhen and also the Guangzhou, uh, Guangdong province factories came into play, the water has been highly polluted and it wasn't good for health. That's my first part, Brian. Thanks, Paul. Our second genealogy explores Shenwan, which following unplanned urbanization under the colonial la laissez-faire policy became the so-called guinea pig for successive British colonial metropolitan planning logics. According to Xinhuan's first district officer, James Hayes, Xinhuan became the testing ground for the colonial government's efforts to create a quote unquote district citizen for the new town. Public space, public realm, or public sphere, in our chapter, we pr prefer to think of publics in the plural. 
in addition to Nancy Frazier's counter and contesting publics, we think of Greater Bay publics as multiple and shifting in the face of multiple forms of governmentality, nationalists, colonial, socialists. Like Margaret Crawford, we do not lament the disappearance of an ideal bourgeois public realm, but identify public space as constantly remade and redefined through emerging social practices. The British accelerated their efforts to nurture a district citizen during the preparations for the signing of the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984. A district advisory board had previously merely conveyed the concerns of local leaders and associations, but a directly elected district board was initiated in 1982, the same year that the NTR red line was extended to Shenwan. Pro-government uh, coalitions dominated the elections through 1994, but in anticipation of the 1997 handover during the honeymoon period that followed, pro-Beijing parties came, gained a consistent majority from 1994 to 2019. However, in 2019, following months of protests, there was a decisive victory of the pro-democratic camp across Hong Kong. However, all of Hong Kong's pro-democracy lawmakers announced their resignations after the forced removal of four colleagues. And six months later, in June 2020, the National Security Act in Hong Kong was passed. Paul? Well, I was, yeah, thank you. Well, I would say in the uh, colonial period, um, the district governance's model did uh, do some good things to the uh, residents in Chuen Wan. Like the one in the 1980s, um, the district governance actually moved the street vendors um, by which uh, one, uh, my grandmother was one of them uh, to the uh, market with actually a physical roof that would protect them from uh, wind and rain. Um, and therefore my grandmom and also, you know, those uh, elder uh, generation got a really uh, chance to uh, exert that what we call the uh, local economy and make a living at that time. Um, as Ryan said, in the 1980s, the MTR, uh, which was also like the, in American terms, it's called the subway system, came into the uh, Trin Wan district. Um, it started the, um, um, the um, infrastructure residential development model by which the residential development income will subsidize the development of the infrastructure. Um, you know, they are actually in a sort of a win-win situation. And um, the MTR not only brought about the uh, investment interest, um, residential, you know, new residential complex and so on, but more importantly, they bought the uh, local um, shopping malls by which the local economy actually got the transformation from those uh, street vendors uh, vegetable selling type of uh, vendors to become something that is grocery shop and so on to serve the uh, publics in Chuen Wan. And more importantly, uh, the deck, uh, the public spaces that, that they uh, contributed uh, would welcome the people to go uh, and enjoy you know, the holidays and so on. And, and unlike those uh, residential developments typology that we have in Hong Kong nowadays, um, they were less gated and they were uh, more welcome by the people at that time. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. And as the map ends, uh, one, you can see the fishing villages that were uh, demolished and rebuilt. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there were no uh, preservations of urban villages in, in Shinwa. Um, finally, uh, we want to talk about um, the IDP, the International Design Program that we hosted at Chu Hai. Uh, between 2006 and 2016. In addition to the various migrations and exiles that constituted the territory of the Great Bay and our pluralistic concept of public space in Xinhuan, our latest genealogy asked the question, what is public space of rather than in the city? Between 2006 and 2016, we directed an international design program, the IDP, that brought together Hong Kong, Thai, and Taiwanese students to explore the emergent publics of Hong Kong, prefiguring the netizen milk tea alliance. If the Pearl Sea itself connected uh, indigenous village structure, uh, the fluid ind indigenous village structure, and the MTR uh, instituted new metropolitan publics, the introduction of the iPhone in 2007, as Marianne tells us, <laughs> assembled in Shenzhen, a few hours north, uh, provided the technology for the new trans-regional and social movements today. 
2014 was a watershed moment with the Sunflower Student Movement in Taiwan, protests following the latest coup in Thailand and the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong. The Milk Tea Alliance emerged more recently out of online discussions uh, between student and youth activists in the three places and solidarity against increasingly authoritarianism and self-censorship from China. Yeah, uh, we have been organizing this kind of international design program for over 10 years. Um, and uh, basically the targets and also our students uh, were the ones who were born in the 90s and some even uh, uh, were not born uh, 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 before the return of Soviet to China in 1997. So they were be basically symbolizing a new uh, kind of a generation. Um, we asked them to make use of the digital technology uh, to have an interplay and document and record and also create, um, you know, like the things that you see here um, to document uh, Trin One and also understand Trin One and examine Trin One. And I would say it was the uh, Wi Fi technology and also the smartphone and also the apps and so on that really, really revolutionized the, uh, uh, the inputs of the students. Um, in terms of the public space and also a public realm, uh, I think for them, uh, we, Hong Kong, I can say speaking now um, geographically in Hong Kong, we are still enjoying uh, uh, the freedom uh, of the public realm in the digital space. I mean, we are still able to get into the uh, YouTube and, uh, and Facebook and whatsoever. So I would say um, we are still having this public uh, space uh, digitally as such. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your attention. I just wanna, hoping Graham Chain made it into the discussion and acknowledge him as an academic advisor at Chuhai for many of those years we've covered in this uh, uh, little talk. Thank you. Well, thank you. So next in line is, um, my co-editor of this book, who has already been introduced by Mark Fraser, so I won't go through the, the bio, but um, Miodrag, I'll um, hand can, over can to I, you. Can I suggest something? There is one yep. question for, uh, because Joan Du needs to leave at 10. So there's a, one question here for her in the in the uh, Q&A. Uh, okay. Paper. Why don't we do that? And then I can present after. Okay. Would you like to read it or okay. share I, um, why don't you, I can't get the okay, okay. window so, open. So, so basically the question is, um, the, uh, 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 it's, uh, I'm interested in hearing from Joan Du about what arguments were made for the smaller scale, slower development, uh, what data was important or impactful to the mayor's office and why? Um. Thank, thank you for that question. And again, apologize to have to uh, have uh, to jump the, the line a little bit. I do have a, another lecture uh, that I have to go to upstairs in 10 minutes, but thanks for the question. Um, so I, I would start by saying that, um, you know, the question asks what arguments were made for smaller scale and slower development. Uh, I would say yes, the public spaces and the buildings were smaller scale or are smaller scale in the urban villages of Shenzhen, but it's by no means slower development. It's actually um, the, the rate or urbanization in the urban villages uh, in some ways have outpaced the formal planning and governmental provisions of public infrastructure, such as schools, clinics, restaurants, libraries, and most and most important housing. And it is forms of affordable housing that's self-built by the villagers. Uh, and, you know, of the roughly slightly less than uh, eight, 300 urban villages in Shenzhen today, the urban villages, while they were not part of this kind of formal planning of the city, the urban villages today still houses 10 million of the 20 million population of Shenzhen. So 50% of the population. So, you know, because the follow-up question is what data was important or impactful to the mayor's office and why? So if we were speaking strictly in data, the urban villages are absolutely essential because if you were to demolish all the urban villages of Shenzhen, one out of two person would lose their home. 
and it is the 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 the, the working population, and it is uh, a provision. It both social, economic, cultural provision that um, because the city grew so quickly, uh, that those provisions are just not, no government, no central plan government, no uh, kind of formal planning could have provided for that. So the, the logical, I would say the logical argument was actually quite easy to make. Um, there was, a, it was some of the more superficially challenging quantitative, because the question specifically was asking data, uh, that, that was asking was, um, oh, um, it's such a valuable piece of land. You hear this very often, such a valuable piece of land in the middle of the city is undervalued uh, by not demolishing and redeveloping into luxury housing and towers. And uh, what we were able to do is we worked with um, uh, researchers in the, this is, I did this when I was, um, teaching and working in Hong Kong, Hong Kong U, and we, we collaborated with um, researchers in our real estate department, and we really looked at a real estate development model. And we showed them that this incremental approach of piece by piece development um, in the phase, in a span of 10, 20 years could generate equal, if not greater sustainable economic return to the urban village itself, who has the development right of the land. So we, um, we, we understood when we were making this at the time, a very radical urban planning proposal, we had to convince them that economics also work. And we tried to convince them that um, by having this incre incremental approach, the economic actually works in the favor of the urban village corporation who are uh, made up of all the board members are the original villagers in that the the ownership of the land uh, sorry the ownership of the building not the land it's still a communist state where land ownership in cities are public or state owned but the ownership of the buildings remains in the hands of the urban village corporation itself uh, and that they are able to economically uh, create that sustainable development and demonstrate at the same time uh, and, and again, jumping to the design argument that multiple scales of public space is important. That the urban villages 10 years ago, as it is today, is not only uh, supporting public life of those who live in the urban village, but actually all of the city. The urban villages are really popular places for people to go for a walk, to go for restaurants, uh, and, and to really go and, and be in a very pleasant and much smaller urban urban space. So I would say, you know, with, without going further into details, uh, I also would like to comment, and this is somewhat related to Brian and Paul's uh, presentation just a bit earlier, is that this was 10 years ago in Shenzhen. Uh, and it wasn't in, in the process of convincing the mayor's office wasn't just the mayor's office, is from the local community, the local planning bureau, the civic, um, the urban planning bureau, municipally, and it was the involvement of many uh, consultants. The jury was an international form, you know, composed of Chinese and foreign experts who selected our, our scheme. Um, I would say this would be unimaginable in Shenzhen today. And for me, this is why I am trying to speak about my research of the process of Shenzhen's urbanization in the span of 20, 40 years, which coincided with China's latest rise. And from my research, which again, is somewhat presented in the book, um, The Shenzhen Experiment, is that it, it was very much a process of decentralization of power. And there was a lot of empowerment of local communities, local publics, um, the term that was used. And especially in Shenzhen, the, there was a, you know, a lot of recognition that power and, and intelligence doesn't always reside in the mayor's office. Uh, and, and that it, it, a lot of what, a lot of what has happened, say, prior to five, six years ago, 
uh, in Shenzhen very much uh, recognized the importance and gave power to individual citizens, individual organizations, and individual local government, whether that local government is a province, uh, a city, a community, district, neighborhood. And, and this is something I, I think that's really important that really, uh, that we have to recognize there has been a drastic change in China in the past five years. And the, I wanna say that the process I'm speaking about really was built up on the momentum of, of, of very much a bottom up and civic movement in Shenzhen. And I am very alarmed. <laughs> Um, and I would like to, again, you know, really raise alarm and call for, for attention to that what's happening in China now and in Hong Kong uh, in the past five years is absolutely something radically different to what took place in China, say, from 1979 until five years ago. And, and this, while it seems to be, you know, this issue of politics, but it does impact everything we're speaking about. Because as soon as we're talking about public cities and public realm, we are talking about um, an, inter an integrated approach to the thinking of the material and the intellectual and the, the social political. And it's, you know, I, again, um, I want to thank Paul and, and Brian and also Marian earlier to give an update of what's happening uh, today. I just left Hong Kong three months ago, Paul, as we said, and it's, um, it's quite emotional actually for me to uh, be um, giving a review <laughs> of a development of, uh, of um, Tianwan. Um, but you, you, Paul, I, I don't know if you had the chance to see my book, but I, I talk about Tianwan and, and these villages, there are these villages on really on the mouth and the coast of the Pearl River Delta, the Greater Bay, excuse me, today. And they have centuries, if not a millennium of continuous development. And it is ironic that the, the villages stayed in Shenzhen, but not in Hong Kong in its kind of organic and historic form. And this is also something that many people uh, would, think it's the opposite in, in some cases. So that's just to say, you know, that the area that is covered in the book, um, I, I hope those of you who are, who are listening, whether online or, or later, um, take a look at it because they really cover a very, very complex and nuanced process of urbanization that is not only unique to China, but I, I would again argue within global uh, urban history. And there's still, and it is a process that, that is, rapidly changing or deteriorating, depending on how you look at it. So it's really, really important for us to really recognize that this is um, such an important topic for us to discuss and continue because the conclusion, the reason why I called my book, The Shenzhen Experiment, in the end of my book, I said that that experiment is far from over. And it is that I, even myself, having um, written the book, I, I would not say that we understand what was the true findings of that experiment yet, because it's still ongoing. And we will see very quickly, hopefully, hopefully not so quick soon, that this unexpected turn of that experiment, what will happen? I have my opinion on it, and, and I hope that we can have a discussion on this, uh, you know, in a few years to see um, how that turns out. Thank you. Actually, that's a great idea. Um, back back in a few years. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Joan. Uh, unless, uh, uh, Tim, unless uh, Brian and Paul have a response. Joan, thank you. So. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to jump. Uh, I, I will watch the recording later to see your presentation, Yodrag. And, okay, uh, and now that I'm in this part of the world, hopefully soon we can do it in person if uh, the new variant doesn't scare off all the governments again. <laughs> bye -bye. That's right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, bye. 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 Okay. Have a great day. Tim, if you, I don't know if you agree, if, if uh, Paul and Brian uh, want to respond, maybe we should. Uh, uh, no, please yeah. go ahead, me a drag. We're okay, all waiting to hear. <laughs> okay, I will do very, right. very brief and quick thing. Let me just uh, share my screen. Give me just one second. Uh, okay, here we go. Share. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, good. All right. So I will run through this. I um, 
uh, uh, authored two chapters in, in the book. It was supposed to be uh, one. It ended up being two. And uh, I, uh, there's no time today for Tim and me to go through all the complexities, of course, that we faced as, and all of us as a group in going through making of this book. Uh, but nevertheless, um, as, uh, as Joandu just mentioned, in fact, uh, uh, halfway through the process, we were hit by the GBA. So in other words, when we started, uh, you know, uh, working on the book and we started talking about the book and conferences and so on and so forth, the, the mega region was existing in the planning, uh, five-year planning documents of the central Chinese government since 2006, but it was really actually since 2014 and particularly 2016 that the mega region becomes really a strategically employed vehicle for the urbanization and, and economic growth across the Chinese national territory. And the, uh, of course, the economic uh, uh, the SESIs and the and the SARS. Um, so the first chapter is uh, the, treats basically the this shift from Pearl River Delta to Greater Bay Area. So from say uh, um, a megalopolitan development, polycentric megalopolitan development to, to the mega region. The, the, the second chapter, which is chapter 17 in the book, actually treats then the role of the public space in the mega regional discourses. It, the reason why I say the role of public space in mega regional discourses is because it is not very clear to anybody working in the field or multiple fields. In fact, as, as uh, previous speakers have pointed out, as to what exactly constitutes the multiple publics at play in mega regional discourses across the world, not only in China. And as also, also as Mary Ann pointed so correctly, uh, in fact, it, it, the debate as to whether public space is a public good or not is a very lively and vibrant debate across the world. So, it, so the, the things we talk about, the things I talk about in these chapters are not necessarily really only characteristic of Chinese development in urbanization today. They're really characteristic of all mega regional development across the world, except for one, region, one dif major difference. And that is, that even though mega regions are, you know, uh, uh, vehicles for uh, economic development, political and economic, particularly economic development, and have emerged across the world in in some form of post-national neoliberal uh, uh, understanding of economic development, they in fact in most of the countries around the world exist in opposition to and sometimes in collaboration with national governments. China is the only example where mega regions are actually developed as a strategic vehicle for the government intervention in territorial and economic development. So this is a huge and radical difference in, in, in which these, these things are conceptualized and how this affects people on the ground. Chinese plan 2014, the next, the, the five-year plan we are currently living through, in fact, is the uh, uh, plan for 23 mega regions. This is the by far the largest number of mega regions in the world. 23 mega regions, which are each considered to have at least 50 million people, and they are interconnected by a very robust uh, network of, uh, um, of course, the railway connections, the, 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 the bullet trains, but also uh, telecommunications, uh, highways, and so on and so forth. All also a part of a planetary strategy through which China has invested in over 80 countries around the world in developing basically an interconnected infrastructure. Uh, uh, which goes under the name, for those of you who are not familiar, Belt and Road Initiative. It has different names in different occasions, but nevertheless, uh, uh, what, what is seen in even in local places in the Greater Bay Area cannot be really detached from the planetary uh, urbanization initiatives. So when we look at the Greater Bay Area, we have this the, the couple of questions, and I just put three, uh, which are some of the questions that I was driven by. For example, can we really talk about public space in the context of mega regional development? Um, um, under what conditions can we frame public space as a relevant subject matter and also coherent analytical unit for us as scholars, right? Uh, in the context of Chinese mega regionalism and particularly in the, in the GBA. Um, and then what is the relation between public space and the emerging public realm in the Greater Bay Area? That also, even though it, in Western scholarship and practice, this is considered to be a, you know, a simultane interchangeable public space and public realm, very often, particularly in practice. In fact, urbanist and architectural practice in particular, in fact, this is no longer to be taken as uh, for granted. 
Um, so what I distinguish then is a couple of things. I will not quote the sources. I'm sure some of you are familiar with my sources. They're all in, in our book. I, I don't have the time to, to quote that, but nevertheless. So I distinguish between GBA mega regionalism as a national strategy focused on governance, economy, planning, and policy, which of course is uh, uh, not of course, which is focused on the production of mega regional space. And then GBA mega regionality in this particular case, uh, which is an ongoing process of producing mega regional geographies, which are operational or vectorized through the production of mega regional spaces and spaces in the mega region. And you will see now how this translates into public space. This is a huge jump now from chapter one to chapter 17. But um, uh, what I then go on to figure out how to parse through uh, uh, in an, really an analytical uh, state of mind, just to make sense of things, is to distinguish between the mega regional public space, uh, which I use the acronym for is uh, TMPS, and the public spaces in the mega region. Um, which is quite actually akin to what uh, really uh, Paul and Brian talked about and, and also what Mary Ann uh, talked about. In fact, what are the examples? What are the instances where you can recognize these differences? Kowloon Station is one of the, the canonical uh, paradigmatic cases here. You can see it, and I, I put four images here because you can see it at all these different scales. It works as a megaform, as a landmark, a symbolic presence in the landscape. It works through the articulation of interior spaces and differentiation through them. It works through underground level, you have actually the border crossing, which is, of course, um, when it was introduced, it was quite um, uh, quite disturbing to the citizens of Hong Kong, uh, because suddenly you can actually enter, uh, uh, it, it violates the broader uh, border protocols that had been agreed upon in 2018. Uh, it simply violates everything. And then, of course, the, the train infrastructure, the uh, the uh, railway infrastructure of fast trains that, that uh, uh, turns in fact spatial distances into temporal distances and in fact really denies that differentiation that was otherwise previously historically present through geographic differentiation, ge geographic spatially bound and place bound differences. And so it's, it works as a strategic vehicle for pro produced by government and business, of course. Um, uh, treats the public, back to Mary Ann's, public as a standardized governable entity, creates a homogeneous narrative, and you can see in relation to Paul and, and Brian, it's not a narratives, it's a narrative, so it's a singular coherent narrative, uh, and it's uh, also a coherent symbolic language, again in the singular and not in plural. Uh, it denies actually the existence of differences. You can see it in all kinds of protocols and, and spaces that are produced through those border crossings, communication, uh, um, even through the organization of the so-called public open space, which now, as you can see up the right, is actually turned into the wildlife map of the Greater Bay Area. So nothing gets, nothing gets, nothing escapes the panoramic view of the of this uh, uh, mega regional uh, dialectic. And so you can see here, the, of course, a, a canonical example of commodified spaces, uh, ludic spaces such as Macau. Uh, the waterfronts have been an uh, excellent example of this uh, across the Greater Bay Area, in, from Guangzhou to Shenzhen to, to Hong Kong. Waterfront developments are, are also a, um, a beautiful example of the de mega regional public space. Uh, revitalization, urban, urban regeneration from uh, from uh, Shenzhen, of course, to uh, Enantu, to uh, Hong Kong, uh, and then uh, to the uh, public spaces in the mega region, which are then seen, of course, in relation to the previous in particular, as fragmented, incoherent, unstable, uneven, and so on and so forth. The spaces of everyday life, Brian mentioned Margaret Crawford, the spaces where struggle and contestation in everyday spaces, in everyday life occurs, spaces of resistance, appropriation, contestation, and so on and so forth. These spaces, of course, occur, uh, one would think, you know, even last time I was there, one would think that this occurs unaffected by the mega regional dialectic, but that's not the case. In fact, as many have pointed out, the, the, the GBA uh, has changed everything, as, as uh, Joanne Du just also pointed out in her presentation. So basically, I use Jacques Ellul's work from the, from the 1970s, where he says, this changes people in the flesh. So it doesn't change just protocols and policies. It changes the way people live their lives. It will change. And so you can see the contestation in actually the, public, the airport and the central business district. Of course, now I, I will run through this. The, um, uh, the semi-spontaneous appropriations of the of the, uh, the domestic foreign workers, uh, small local parks, and then the very importantly, and I will finish with this design. Um, uh, um, the role the design and planners, designers actually play 
in, uh, in these appropriations and contestations. This is one example of the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong and Hendrik Thieben's team uh, the, with the Magic Carpet Project. Another one also with the same group, the A Formal Academy, which is another chapter in our book by uh, Merv and Jason. And then, of course, uh, uh, Paul and Ryan already talk about that, so I will not go through it. Uh, and that's Jose de Jesus uh, in the, uh, on the front image. Uh, and then uh, some of the things that uh, Tim and I and others have done, uh, colleagues have done in actually bringing students together in the last five or six years in workshops to figure out actually what is really, uh, what, what is, as Brian and Paul exactly said, what really happens and, and how can we begin through pedagogical work to understand and frame uh, and design courses of action as to how to, to transform what we see as inadequate. I'll stop there, Tim. So I took 10 minutes. Good. No, that's great. I think this this kind of is pulling together a lot of the threads and, and showing how, the th unfortunately, you know, I would have loved to have gathered all the authors, but I think this helps paint the bigger picture in which we can understand the contribution we've just seen. I, we've got another question in the Q&A, and I'll invite participants to put any any questions in there the, um, that they have. This one's for Marianne. Uh, the question is, every public space now sounds like a mini border, each with its own gatekeeper. Does this relate in any way to the long history of gates within China? Also, are bodies differently regulated within informal public spaces within urban villages? You're, you're muted, Marianne. You're, your microphone's muted. Okay. History of gates in China, wow. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's overlap. I, I mean, I'm not prepared to speak on like a 3000 year history of gates and walls and whatnot, but I do think that gated communities are a really important part of what's happening in cities worldwide. Um, I think that malls have always been different, differently regulated throughout the world. Um, I, when I was in high school, I was part of the first generation of malls, and how we dressed and was actually regulated. And you know, people were sometimes turned away from the Rockaway Mall in New Jersey. Go figure, right? Right outside of Dover. Um, I think it's 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 it's. it's Different, it's differently regulated everywhere. And I think that this is really important. You can be in two neighboring spaces and it's gonna be differently regulated. A lot of it has to do with class. I live in a really, um, one of the richer areas. I live in the Shoko area, but I live in the oldest um, housing in the area. So we have the lowest rent outside of the villages in the area. And per meter, our rent is actually lower than the neighboring villages because um, village housing tends to be cheap in total, but it's not necessarily cheaper per square meter, right? So we aren't actually, we walk in and out all the time, you know, when the guards are asked to regulate us, they do but otherwise they watch, they look at their phones. However, our neighbors, which were, where the housing estate was built about 20 years after us, 2007, 2008, which is a much higher end community. And um, the people who live there aren't, at, like the people who live where I live are basically renters. And it's very possible that the people who own the houses we rent live in the next door estate. That's possible. But where we live has also been rented out. Buildings have been rented out by different employers and then give a lot, their um, workers can also live there. So it's very much functioning in terms of housing. A lot of the older neighborhoods are now functioning. Housing estates are functioning like this as um, villages have been demolished. and our neighbors actually check, right? Our neighbors check everyone who goes in and out. Um, and this is, these are, we're, we're neighbors and um, we can watch it happen. Whereas um, when we, when I went to Yantian at Shajing and Shatojiao, and they're right next to the Yantian 
port. And the port has been the source of various cases of po positive um, COVID. And within Chateau Jiao next to the port, there are, there are buildings, there are um, areas that will actually require you to fill out a form if you've been outside of Shenzhen for 14 days. And so there's actually no consistency no consistency in how it's being actually enforced, but it does t seem to be tied to class. Um, richer neighborhoods are being more are doing more about it. And as villages and different places have started to get more, um, have more need of economic um, inputs and areas, <clears throat> and the gatekeeping has led to congestion, actually side doors, have started opening. And so I was in a mall the other day where they were really strict about checking us going in, but then I went to the bathroom and when I came out, there was a side door that was completely open and people were coming in and out of it. And, and, and so it's not, so that there's now a lot of side doors happening, but again, higher end things need more levels of surveillance. So going down um, the bus, you don't have to show your ID card. You don't have to show your, your COVID pass. You can just get in and off of the bus. Subway, you have to show your COVID pass in order to use the subway. Um, trains and planes require COVID testing. And depending on where you're going or where you're coming from, the time frame in which the COVID tests are required differ. And then when you get to wherever it is you're going, how it is enforced is again, different. Um, so yeah, because even villages are different. I went through, I went to Shuiwei and two, a month ago, Shuiwei was still checking, but last week they were not. So again, it changes, but some villages check, some villages do not. Great. So I'm just going back to the next question, one that we can sort of piggyback on this because it's picking up on a, the, the um, term critical public space that I, I guess Marianne introduced. And the question is, I mean, Marianne, you specifically referred to an absence of critical public spaces. And the question is for you, and I guess for any of the speakers is what would constitute critical public spaces in a context such as Shenzhen, Hong Kong, the context that we're addressing here. Um, anyone else? <laughs> well, if I, if I may, may add also in relation to that, then the notion of social publics that Paul and Brian mm -hmm. talked about. So um, where do these kind of overlap, really? The critical public spaces and this multiple and social, well, both social publics. Yeah, and I, I, I wanted to um, back up because there are a couple of uh, historical questions that I, I thought were really important and related to what you're talking about, Mia Drag, in terms of the, you know, what you seem to be saying is the overreach of mega regional planning. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Juan, Juan mentioned um, the 800 year, 1000 year history of the urban villages. Um, the urban villages in Shenwan are only 300 years because of the 17th century, there's something called the Great Clearance where the Qing dynasty was holding out in Taiwan and um, the emperor in Beijing made everybody <laughs> on the coastal areas. Um, I'll have to look at Wik Wikipedia a little bit, but Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, Jinggan, and Shanggong were all clear to people who could, farmers and villages who could feed Taiwanese. So um, <laughs> this is, has a history to it. Um, and so uh, we only found 300 year Hakka villages that are described in the, 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 the um, village structure, the Greater Bay structure, the Pearl Delta structure, which is a fluid village-based system and market-based system without the same kind of borders that uh, uh, Jonathan's mentioning, um, gates and borders. Um, but the gates and borders, of course, everyone in the new school knows we go through them daily. Um, and, um, and with our, our, our little portal checks and our green light on our cell phones. Um, but um, in terms of uh, Jonathan's question to Marianne, again, at Shenwan, it's quite interesting because um, the villages, of course, are, are 
gated. I mean, there are extended family clan structures and each, each clan has a separate village and their own temple. Um, and then the British create, and, and, and Paul can speak to this a little bit, quite a open public space system that's in consultation with the village elders and then with the immigrant associations of the laborers. Um, and they um, move everybody around, but there's a kind of, um, you know, kind of British idea of a public that um, has a, a, a managed open shared space um, where everybody can get along as a district citizen. Um, and so, um, but Paul can speak about um, his, his time during the last 40 years, again, that one's talking about where um, this, these gates reappear. Um, and so um, there's a kind of, and, and it, it is that bourgeois public sphere that we all know and love that disappears. I, I, I don't know, Paul, if you want to talk about that a bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I don't know whether everybody knows, but uh, this um, Chunwan district was supposed to be the very first satellite town concept uh, designed by the uh, colonial government. And the aim was to spread the population away from the city center in order to uh, cultivate uh, a new sort of a town, uh, which would be self-sufficient, uh, which by, by which you can actually work, you can actually, you got hospital, you were born there, and then you got education, you have this uh, 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 primary, secondary schools and hospitals and so on. And then you can actually die there because there is a cemetery literally uh, situated in Chuen Wan. So in terms of this, um, critical public space. I would say when the British actually designed this kind of satellite town, they did actually inject a component of um, um, city hall, which provide, uh, you know, recreational like dramas and, uh, you know, cultural activities and events in those uh, public arena. Another critical public space that I can imagine was the introduction of all this football uh, hot ground by which I used to play. Uh, it wasn't the kind of the long type that the uh, uh, conventional uh, soccer uh, pitches uh, would, uh, would have. Uh, but those would be the ones that were um, actually um, hard ground. And those were the, the places for the, for the enjoyment of the workers, particularly the ones who actually uh, worked in the factories during lunchtime and was wherever they would just uh, go down, went down and actually played uh, soccer. So those were the critical public spaces that I would say that was like almost like a top-down uh, situation. Uh, moving forward, I would say nowadays, uh, a lot of things are, are basically zoned, uh, E-Z-O-N-E-D, in such a way that, uh, for example, uh, we have a very big park, um, which is actually approaching the sea, but um, it's not gated, but it is gated in the sense that there were so many signs that said that um, you cannot eat, you cannot drink, you cannot play, you know, um, uh, 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 music loudly. You cannot even, you know, take your pets inside. So I would say um, in terms of the, the, the size of the public space is actually getting bigger. But in terms of freedom, there are certain sort of a, uh, regulating uh, principles behind. Um, so that's my experience in that. Yeah. Good. Oh, sorry, did, did I hear someone wanting to chime in? Well, maybe Mary Ann, just uh, briefly about the critical, the notion of the critical public space. Yeah. Um, I mean, social publics also works, but I, I think that the way surveillance operates in the PRC makes it really important to have safe spaces where conversations between different kinds of people can actually take place and that can be sustained and supported. It, it, you know, it's not enough just to have, be able to throw things up online, but you actually to have places where it is safe to have face-to-face -face conversations um, where, diff where different kinds of things can grow. I mean, one of the things that was really tragic for me, you know, was when we were evicted from by Sir Joe for the demolitions. Um, we had been there for seven years and we knew we knew people around us. I mean, people come, people go, people come, people go. But 
we were identified with that space. Our work was identified with that space. We were growing into different kinds of conversations because of the work we were doing in that space. And once we were evicted, you know, we, we've, and then COVID happened, we kind of find ourselves trying to figure out what's the next site of intervention and how, and, it, and it's not simply by Joe where this happened. We, the children's program we ran in Dalang, when leaders were changed, they decided to run a different kind of public program. And so it's not simply these conversations, it's not simply being able to um, talk about things in a, in a bar or a coffee shop, but being able to grow certain kinds of spaces and be able to plan for a future that's more than a year down the line or five years down the line to really be able to envision oneself as taking place in a space and that what one does there can be in a kind in a, in dialogue and in critical dialogue with what is happening around and you you know i'm tactics and strategies you know tactics are great but strategies wins the war right And Which is then something to be said about Mark's question about the mega regionalism mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, whether uh, mega regions are unique to and what is happening. What I described is unique to, to China. It's not yep. actually. Um, in fact, what is really what I was inspired by is uh, Ali Madanipur's um, mm -hmm. analysis of what happens in European public spaces in the last fifteen or twenty years, and he comes to the same conclusion. So, uh, so it's not unique to China. What is unique to China is the power of the government and the lack of resistance mm -hmm. uh, it has in implementing whatever it, it deems necessary or desirable. And that's unique because there is no resistance. In Europe, of course, there is, a, there is a, even though besides all the resistance, still, still, things still happen. You know, so, uh, so this is a debate for, this is, this is for, another, for another event possibly, you know, but it's not unique to China, even though there are, I, I write in the chapter that it's actually a mega regionalism, a mega regionalism with Chinese characteristics, um, mm. but it's definitely mega regionalism is not Chinese and not Chinese invention. And yes, the Chinese of no. course government has learned from others and from the experiences in the United States in particular, and also, also elsewhere in Europe. Yeah, and I just yeah. want to footnote Jiang Ying Jia's work on connecting Xi Jinping's thinking to the imperial past. That's why I mentioned the Great Clearance. Mm. So um, mm. this is his guidebook. It's not Marx. Mm. I, I, if I can just add one thing, Brian, uh, also in, in relation to this discussion about social publics, publics, multiple publics, uh, 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 critical public spaces, what is also interesting, and I try to emphasize that as much as I can, uh, it's the reduction of all plurality and all difference to a homogeneous narrative, to singularity that really distinguishes. And that's the, what I perceive as a larger shift uh, from PRD to GBA, if you like. Uh, that's the larger shift. It's a singular homogeneous mm -hmm. narrative that then now restructures everything uh, over time, of course. Uh, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a really, that's a tricky part. It's not unique to China, it happens everywhere, but that's really the some, something we need to think about. And that's why critical public space, if you talk about public space, if you use the traditional methods of analysis and even designer planning, uh, you, can't, you cannot play that game. It no longer applies. It's a completely different rules, uh, 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 rules of the game. And so that's why the puzzle, the question, like, so, so how do we even begin to approach this now? And that's what draw at least my, my thinking through this project. Well, we've, we've arrived at the end of our allotted time. Um, so I think um, I want to thank the speakers. I mean, uh, uh, John Du in her absence, Marianne O'Donnell, Brian McGrath, Paul Chu, uh, my, you know, my co-editor, Mia Dragmatosinovich, um, and also um, the India China Institute and all, all those who've sort of helped in the background to facilitate this. I'll hand over to Mark then, I guess, to, um, put the closing bracket on this. Let me just also say thank you to all and particularly to, to uh, Grace and Mark and Manjari, of course, for the support and for organizing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, just to the audience, uh, thanks for joining us today. This is, of course, our last event of this year, but uh, you'll be on the lookout soon for uh, events we have coming up in, in spring 22. Uh, 
uh, among which will be a, a comparative urban uh, discussion between China and India by some uh, two authors of recent books, uh, as well as uh, an event uh, in February uh, in which a, an Indian journalist who spent a lot of time in China will be talking about uh, her, her investigation reporting and writing about Indian um, medical students and other uh, communities, uh, Indian communities in China today. Uh, but be on the lookout for that. And thanks to everyone, uh, especially Tim and Miadrag for putting together such a wonderful book. And uh, I hope uh, everyone in the audience will have access uh, to it soon and, and find it in your favorite uh, independent bookstore. Thank you. <laughs>